It's awkward to do a talk when you're not presenting anything new. Not only is there none of the research or theory in here innovative or even a creative application of it, it is so bog standard it's available in every introductory textbook on macroeconomics you can find. And uh, I'm applying it exactly the way it was intended. But hopefully by the end of this talk you'll agree with me that it is a conversation that is uh, worth worth it to keep having. So frame this in terms of COVID, and COVIDonomics was a tentative title, but it wasn't really founded. The, the origin, this is actually an application of, of a lecture I was already working on, uh, but the application to COVID was so relevant, so timely that it basically spurred me on to do it now. So the problem with COVID and in particular, the economic aspect impact of COVID is going to be the very negative implications it already seems to be having and I think will likely continue to have. I'm not going to project uh, to uh, too specifically, too finitely, that's for smarter economists than me, but uh, the evidence seems to be pointing that it is going to be negative, it's going to be persistent, it is going to continue. And uh, ultimately, uh, I've seen this compared, the impact of COVID compared to the Great Depression. And this should be heartening to econ economists because this is where a lot of great work was done. The uh, specialization, the discipline, the focus of macroeconomics really came, was really born by the uh, Great Depression and the impact it had all across the world, but in particular the United States. Uh, John Maynard Keynes here, uh, his theory, all of his theories describing what happened and uh, understanding and explaining the Great Depression led to theoretical work that is still taught to this very day in intro micro macroeconomics classes, including by uh, myself. This is very basic, straightforward stuff. And now what I want to talk about is the negative impact of COVID has been, uh, we've already seen it and it's already clear the government needs to not only continue with its uh, bursaries uh, aid and, and intervention, but uh, it's going to have to do more of it and it's going to have to persist long after the pandemic recedes. Um, numbers, the, the most recent numbers I've seen in, in Saskatchewan, which was rated as one of the least impacted economically by COVID, still lost something on the order of 55,000 jobs in the first quarter of 2020. And this, these impacts are only going to continue to cascade. It's crucial because just as COVID's uh, the concern for COVID isn't just about the uh, acute symptoms and the acute impacts of catching, of contracting it, but about the externality events, the uh, infection events, the infection potential that we are reliant on interconnectedly, not only our own choices about our health, but those of everyone around us and the rates of infection and the rate of virulence. It's important to think of us as one system, as, as a community, and just so with economics. We can't be just concerned about those who have lost employment uh, or seen themselves financially impacted by COVID, but we need to recognize that the indirect knock-on effects that come, that it's not just the money that uh, these, work, these, these cyclically unemployed workers uh, now don't have and can't contribute to the economy, but how does that impact the income and thus expenditure of everyone else in the economy and how this cascades? And ultimately, like I said, this can be this thinking can be applied to any number of large scale intervention programs. My initial framing example for this was about Medicare for all in the United States. And uh, Ultimately, the argument, and the same thing I don't want to see happen with, corona, with, with COVID or the coronavirus, um, is that uh, discussions, important discussions about the best and most effective way to implement such aid and, and benefits is derailed uh, at, from the starting line when people are starting to ask the question, how are we going to pay for it? How are we going to pay for it? And my impetus for doing this around Medicare for All was the exact argument of how are you going to pay for the system? And... Uh, it saddens me because I think it is it is a forceful and, and true, I, I think it's a good argument and it, with convincing support of the data that uh, by you, you insured every American or every, it just isn't in Canada, we insure every Canadian resident. Um, 
that that leads to a healthier society and a healthier society is a more productive society, which means we're going to see increase in, in growth in GDP, and that includes government revenues. So it isn't going to be as costly as people seem, as people like to accuse it of. But that uh, argument apparently doesn't find enough truck. So I want to talk about the argument of how do we pay for it. Now, this really isn't an economic application. This is an accounting application. This is uh, literally about how much how much a, a figure. Program X costs Y dollars. Where are we going to get Y dollars from? And this is probably at its most concrete, the mathematics. Very quantitative. I like that because it is. You need $5 billion, $50 billion, whatever. Where are you going to get that $50 billion? Now, the obvious answer is taxes, and nobody really likes taxes, and there's a lot of arguments around that. So, uh, it, it, and then that, that can also forestall the argument, the, the actual analysis that needs to be done is how to make the most ineffective intervention rather than how are we going to pay for it. So I'm going to introduce a solution and uh, it's going to be somewhat of a heresy for me to even suggest it, but please bear, bear with me. But there is a solution to any one of these problems and that is print it. It doesn't matter how much the program costs, 100,000, 100 million, 100 billion. You can always pay for it just by printing the money. And that is a pure accounting solution. If it's going to cost you Y dollars, print Y dollars. Now, uh, I appreciate you give that. I needed to make the point that that is possible, but printing is not a magic bullet. It's not as glib as that. And let's talk about the cost of just printing your problems away, which is hyperinflation. For those of you who are unfamiliar with the term, inflation means increase in prices. Hyperinflation just means rapid increase in prices, particularly over a short period of time. So hyperinflation is when you start to see things like prices doubling every year, every month, every week. And I believe in the greatest uh, rate, the greatest modern incidence of hyperinflation uh, in Zimbabwe, we saw prices doubling uh, every day. Um, maybe in Hungary in the 40s, it was doubling twice a day. But still, think about how, how, how difficult this would make the world. If Even if prices were doubling every year, you paid $8,000 in tuition this year, well, that's going to be 16000 next year. And the year after that, it's going to be thirty two. And you just start thinking about how all these costs cascade and how it really it really throws out of kilter the delicate ecosystem of our economy. So we need to be concerned about hyperinflation. And the mainstream answer, when you look to economics of what, where does hyperinflation come from, the default answer, the, the base, the, 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 uh, the mainstream answer is it starts when a government's, when a country's government begins printing money to pay for its spending. Government's printing too much money. And so anytime anyone would ever suggest before this, it, it, it's largely ignored. Nobody talks about it. Well, can't we print our way out? Because the answer is, well, if you want to start hyperinflation, and it can be laughed out. But I think it bears further analysis than that, deeper analysis. Pay attention to it. Because first, um, while it is true that every, I, I believe every example of hyperinflation in history, but I can only speak confidently to those post the 20th century, uh, the turn of the 20th century, um, and every single time we have seen hyperinflation, it has been uh, very, you know, it has been at the same time a government has been engaged in printing, engaging in massing amount, massive amounts of monetary expansion through the printing of money. That's not causation, that's correlation. So uh, one of the points I also want to make when my little bugbears is about the difference between correlation and causation. And I've asked a lot of people, even smart people, educated people, people, researchers who deal, their, their livelihood is causation. And I ask, how, how comfortable are you with your understanding of the difference between correlation and causation? And I'm not surprised that a lot of people aren't that comfortable. With, I myself wasn't really comfortable with uh, being able to make that distinction until very recently, only a few years, and I teach statistics. Uh, so I, I empathize with people who aren't comfortable about it and maybe are a little too embarrassed to, to ask. So uh, the difference between correlation and causation, correlation is necessary but not sufficient. You need to have some correlation. You need to say, we see these, th these two things at the same time, but you need a robust theory that can explain a, that the, the, the linkage between them is causal. Right. The difference between correlation and causation is theory. So let's look at the theory. 
first, in full disclosure, I left my error up here, but I always thought this equation was called the Fisher equation. I taught it in classes as the Fisher equation, but it's not the Fisher equation. That's a name of a totally different equation. This is a monetary supply equation. It doesn't have a consistent name that I could find, but here we go. Uh, this is the theory. So it's, a, it's, again, very algebraic, but it is very simple when you break down to it. I think it is very intuitive once you describe it. So you have an equality, and this equality comes from a tautology. It's just inherently, uh, obviously true. We have all the goods sold by producers on one side and all the goods bought by buyers on the other side. And these have to be equal, right? By definition, you cannot sell something without a buyer. You cannot buy something without a seller. So they must be balanced. So on when we're talking about sold by producers, we have two figures. Now, this example uses P and Q. I see that a lot. I myself prefer P and Y, um, but there are a few, there are lots of different ways that this can be described. I've seen this described all as one term combined in together. And fundamentally, it's not the most precise way of describing it, but it'll do is you're talking about how much you sold versus how much it costs, right? It's the price times quantity. Um, now, uh, typically, uh, I like Y and I like to use Y as real GDP and, and specifically, uh, potential GDP, uh, the, the sustain, uh, the economy at full employment GDP, um, uh, y bar in macroeconomics, I like that. And then P represents a price level, but uh, usually some some broad measure of uh, the rate uh, prices have changed globally. But it's not important. You can think about it even in imprecise terms as the price of what you're buying and everything you're buying. On the other side, while buyers must be matched to sellers, uh, we don't need to match units of currency to, to purchases, right? There is not one individual dollar bill or specie of currency uh, for every single dollar that's spent because we reuse money, right? You buy something from a vendor, the vendor will use that same money to make their own purchases and that vendor will, and whoever they bought it from will use their money and so on. So we have the money supply, which is actually what the quantity of units of currency in an economy and the velocity of money, which is basic, which is literally just how often the average number of transactions a uh, unit of currency is used in, right? How many times each dollar bill is spent, more or less. So when we look at this model, this equation, we talk about how does this cause inflation? So these are two uh, terms. They have to be equal. Now, if we print money, we are changing these terms. We are increasing money supply, right? So we've increased this whole side. That means we have to see an increase on this side. Now, um, we can see exactly where this is going to go because traditionally, like I said, this has been Y or Y bar. Uh, we'll use Q bar. It's fine, the quantity, because we're not adding anything new to GDP, right? We're not producing anything more. We're just throwing a bunch of money in the economy. So this, this is fixed. And that means that if this side is going to increase, it all has to come through P. And with P increasing, that's price level, that's inflation. So we see uh, as the money supply increases, we'll see a proportionate increase in the price level, which is inflation. So the model says money supply uh, increases in the monetary expansion leads to inflation. Now where this gets into hyperinflation, what the problem is, if you increase the money supply so much that you increase the price level so much that you start getting where prices are increasing rapidly, increasing by a great amount. Like go back to that tuition example, if it's going to double next year, the, you, you see start to see changes in behavior. People respond to that. The hyperinflation idiom or joke is in hyperinflation, you take a bus, not a cab because you pay in advance. Right. Every, with prices doubling uh, in a relatively short period of time, the shorter they get, the more pressure there is to spend now. Right. If your tuition is going to double every year, your instinct is, well, I want to prepay tuition. And uh, if all prices are, are rising quickly, you're starting to see a problem where um, that that the cost of holding money, the cost of saving up is is being eaten up by all this inflation. So people start spending more and they start spending their money rapidly. And that can increase the velocity of money. Um, and if the velocity of money increases, that means the left side increases. And if the left side increases, that means the price level is going to have to increase to balance this equation. But now prices have increased even more. So velocity of money increases again, and that can drive up prices again. And you can see how this becomes a vicious cycle.
In the textbook example of hyperinflation, the Weimar Republic in Germany, Germany was printing money to pay off the debt they'd been saddled with at the end of World War I, and uh, prices expanded so rapidly, so fast, that uh, workers started demanding to be paid daily in cash, and the story goes, I heard that they would be paid twice a day, and at lunchtime, all the men would pick, take their, their wage for their half day, run to the fences where wives were waiting, they would just throw the money through the gate and say, you know, like basically just encouraging their wives to scramble, pick up the money, get, and then run to the, rush to the store as quick as possible to spend it. Spend it all, because the longer we wait on it, the less it's going to be worth. And that's the problem with hyperinflation, right? But... First way I want to critique this is two key omissions that I think are really notable from the the narrative that uh, we tell ourselves that comes from this theory that when the government prints too much money, that causes hyperinflation. The first is this doesn't say government. This just says when the money supply increases. And now the government is the most reliable and has the biggest uh, ability, you know, is the most obvious uh, one who can impact the money supply, right? They have the most tools at their disposable to expand it, but they're not the only ones, right? Um, banks can expand the money supply, right? I'm a bit of a pinko, uh, so don't take me at my word, but this is mainstream theory. Peter Coit would tell you that fractional banking, fractional reserve banking increases the money supply. And in the United States, uh, although the regulations are not for this purpose, they have regulations in place that can limit the amount that a bank can increase the money supply. In Canada, we have no such limit. And in Canada, our banks are big enough that they certainly could do, could, could increase the money supply to this effect. But we never talk about it. We never talk about this as a potential, right? We only talk about when government does it. And that's correlation, not causation. The causation just as much could be we should be, if we're going to be worried about governments doing it, we should be worried about what banks are doing and keeping an eye on what they're doing because it can impact it just as much. The other thing I want to talk about is uh, the assumption that makes the uh, this particular interpretation possible. So John Harvey wrote an article uh, for uh, Forbes magazine, basically saying the exact same thing I'm saying, right? Money growth does not cause inflation because, again, it's mainstream theory. It's taught in intro texts. I'm not the first person to discover this. But given that this article was pro was was uh, posted pretty much nine years ago to the day, I'm not very optimistic that my particular video is going to be uh, the one that finally gets us to the tipping point where we can shatter this myth that money growth must cause inflation. So John Harvey, uh, that is a good article. If you want to do a little bit more reading on it, I'd recommend it. Uh, but you don't have to because I'm stealing most of the good parts uh, wholesale uh, because... Uh, I found the way he presented the argument very convincing. So with sites to him, uh, one, the first is, uh, I think his, he walked to the example of math that I didn't think was going to be very insightful, but I think uh, it helps. And the other bit uh, is something about the assumptions he was making. So we're, again, still just talking about MV is equal to P, and I'll use Y here because it's there. This is a simple example I took from a slide share for Econ 221. Uh, and they use a simple example where the GDP is just one good pizza. They have all the numbers here. So we can do the math and we can see, okay, the money supply is 10 grand. The velocity of money is three. The price level is 10, 10 bucks. And the... Uh, and I guess this is 10K, keep units, and the GDP is 3,000, 3K. So we do this, we can see that this is 30K, and it equals 30K. And that's nice, it's in balance. Now, let's say we jack up the money supply, like we've been doing, right? So let's double it. Let's say it's now 20,000, right? So now, instead of 10K, we have 20K. And so then 20 times 3, that's going to lead us to 60K. And we're still at 30K on this side, right? So it needs to go up. Now, the theory tells us that, well, look, we've added the money supply. We didn't add any more pizzas. We didn't add any more of that. So the way, the only way we can balance this is by having it go up through price. So price could go up to $20, and then that'll give us 60, right? It's $20 a pizza. We sell the three pizzas, and now we've balanced it. But again, that comes from the idea that we're holding this constant. And that's why I deliberately chose my favorite definition of it when I talked about it and then hand waved past it, is that we're at full employment GDP. Because uh, in economic, uh, macroeconomic theory, uh, 
potential GDP is sustainable. If you even if you shoot past, uh, even like even if you if you add more GDP to it, you, it's not the hard limit. You can be higher uh, than potential GDP, but then you're going to be in an, exp- an expansionary gap. You are going to still see inflation that's driving up the economy, and it'll it's going to be a period of big inflation, and you will ultimately see the economy return to potential GDP because it's the only sustainable one with the use of resources. But uh, John Harvey's article, he put this perfectly, he said, because he wrote that in 2011, which was on the heels of the Great uh, Recession with the banking sector collapse and the sub, subprime mortgage crisis in the United States. But uh, if you taught macroeconomics in uh, that period, you know that because the United States was experimenting with the quantitative easing, which for many economists was just printing money by a fancier name, uh, we were promised a torrent. I, a lot of economists I really admire. I taught in class because theory said, oh, this is going to lead to a ton of inflation. We're going to see this explosion. And that was nine years ago. Where did this inflation go? And that's because we took a very key assumption. We assumed that we were at potential GDP, so we couldn't go fire. John Harvey put a great in his article, say, I can look out my window and see we're not at potential at potential GDP. We have tons of unemployment. And I just quoted one of the driving impetus of this is all of the provinces are seeing huge amounts of cyclical unemployment, unemployment attributable to COVID. That means we're not at potential GDP. That means using the same simple example, if we want to double the money supply and we don't want it to be goal, go into inflation, all we have to do is say, well, if we're going to add 10 more K, Let's be able to get more. Let's just make sure with this 10K we're adding to the economy, let's add more pizzas, right? Let's just jack up the pizzas because theoretically, right? You don't have to we'll go to 20. You can just say, well, let's just get to 6K pizzas. 6K pizzas will get us to the same 60-60 balance. And if you can invest that money supply expansion into real GDP, uh, and again, uh, like it's not, of course, it's not as simple as, well, you just use the 10 grand to buy more pizzas, but in a real economy, there's a million goods. Uh, so many, there's, there's so many goods and services If the government can make sure to target its money supply expansion, its expansionary policies so that they are increasing GDP and limiting the amount of exposure they have to these inflationary pressure releases. You can print money without seeing the cost of inflation. If you are looking at an inf- a recessionary gap and you just print enough money to push it back up to it, you're not going to see inflation. I mean, that's easier said than none, but again, we aren't hamstrung by this necessity to say printing money, monetary expansion equals inflation. It doesn't have to. Not if you have capacity for GDP to uh, absorb that expansion before it can turn into inflationary pressure. Now, of course, it's not over yet. I'm being very glib on this. It is still very important to say, how do we target this aid? How do we make sure... Uh, How do we do it in the right and most efficient way to make sure that we are putting as much of this expansionary monetary policy, this this new money into GDP growth? The argument I used for uh, American Medicare for all is to say, you know, if Bill Gates or Jeff Bezos or some other billionaire who doesn't deserve it, which is all of them, uh, would just write the check and say, I'm going to pay off, I'm going to pay the premiums for every uninsured American this year. That would be straight GDP growth. You are seeing monetary exchange for a good or service that has value. That's pure GDP growth. Theoretically, if the government just, by this theory, if the government printed that exact check and put it in, you're not going to see any inflation because it's all going to go to GDP growth. Now, there are a lot of other factors at play. You might see substitution uh, people pushing into the um, uh, using the aid to do spending they would have done already, which isn't GDP expanding. But again, you can do the analysis and think about it. And my goal here wasn't to have the perfect solution, was just to shut down one argument, the argument that keeps stalling all of these things at the at the uh, start line. How are you going to pay for it? We'll print it. We can print it. If you are thoughtful about how you print and if you uh, do a good job at uh, targeting the the printing, the expansion to increasing GDP, you don't leave a lot of room for inflationary pressure. And what that means is that you end up with um, 
uh, you can you can fund the program as long as you are choosing a program that is going to expand GDP in an efficient way. You are minimizing your risk to inflationary pressure. And again, remember that the that that hyperinflation that's just correlation and it's not perfect. The United States did a ton of quantitative easing, expansionary monetary policy in the wake of the. Uh, global recession of 2008, 2009, and we didn't see any inflation from it. So it's still an option. What my talk wants to be is just to say, we don't have to worry about how to, in, in times of disaster, we don't have to worry about how to pay for it because we can print it. We should be thoughtful about how we do it, but we always have the option to print it. If you are unconvinced by this, let me just say one thing. What is the, why do we have such a compelling narrative about it? Why is the narrative so against this? Because there is risk, big risk of inflation. And not all inflation is bad. If you get a raise at work and you haven't increased your productivity in your job by the exact amount, by the exact proportion you've been uh, or more than uh, you were given a raise, then your raise is inflation. The employer is paying more for the same thing, which is the definition of inflation. So inflation isn't all bad, except there's one group that inflation is always bad for. Because as I described in the example, one of the reasons the velocity of money gets crazy when price levels go up is because inflation always, 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 always reduces the value. It increases the cost of holding money. And you know who holds a lot of money? Rich people. So if you are that concerned about inflation, um, I want you to ask, how much does it really benefit you and how much does it benefit uh, those that are wealthier than you? I mean, maybe it's an efficient choice, but I just think people shouldn't have. Uh, I don't like that our dog is being wagged by the tail that is the few, the elite, the wealthy. So with that, thank you for coming to my TED Talk. I appreciate your attention. I will be taking no questions.